a very good evening to all members of the white army a uh, warm welcome to this special session on financial literacy for medicos and uh, to talk about this very important and often misunderstood topic is uh, none other than a cav patabhiram sir uh, he is a practicing chartered accountant and a founding member of yoganandan ram chennai he is renowned public speaker in india and uh, on several platforms across the globe he uh, is a very well known personality among uh, the chartered accountant fraternity especially among the students um, he has taught over 75000 ca students his textbook first lessons in strategic financial management is very popular among the ca students um he has authored several uh, other uh, best seller financial books as well yesterday his self help book the post pandemic graduate was released by uh, n lakshmi narayanan vice chairman emeritus cognizant uh, this is just a brief introduction and uh, he also has a online course uh, which has over 1 lakh 40000 registered students uh, he being a rank holder throughout uh, he is a treasure of knowledge and uh, sir it's a privilege to have you here this evening uh, a very warm welcome to you sir uh, thank you thank you very much the pleasure i think somesh is mutual uh, thank you so much sir and uh, without any further ado we would like to uh, begin this discussion and uh, i would like to request the viewers to type in the questions uh, in the chat box and we would like to have a q and a session towards the end um so today on behalf of and from the perspective of a medical student or a young medico we seek your expert advice on the fundamental topics of finance uh, to begin with uh, can you please explain about what is the value of money and uh, value for money all right uh, first of all before i start uh, i must place on record uh that i have enormous respect for the medical profession uh there are many who raise a lot of fundamental questions but i am someone who has enormous respect for the medical profession i believe that the medical profession like the profession from where i come from the chartered accountant profession is a profession of trust but one step ahead is the medical profession because it's a profession that people turn to when they are not well so that's first thing i wanted to place on record uh, i love get down to answering the question that somya she put out um in if you look at it from a medical perspective money has a value or uh, sorry time has a value time is not infinite in in the real sense of the term while time might be infinite for each individual it is finite how much is the time for me is different perhaps from how much is the time for you but for all of us whether we are the president of the united states of america or whether we are a janitor in a remote hospital in bangalore the time in a day is the same uh, that's from a life perspective from a medical perspective but from a money perspective there is something else to time uh, there are a few uh, there is something else to the time value of money uh, you'll have to give me a little bit of time to try explain this the most fundamental point that we talk about in the value of time which is actually the first point that gets read in any any what should i say learning on investment is that money has a time value what it essentially means is that the money that you receive today the 100 rupees that you receive today is more valuable than the 100 rupees that you receive a year later why is that so there are three fundamental reasons the most obvious of them the most obvious of them is the fact that what money can what 100 rupees can buy today is much more than what 100 rupees can buy a year later let me give you a very simple example suppose you want to buy a textbook and let's for argument or let's say you want to buy a novel let's say you want to buy chetan bhagat's latest novel let's say the price of that novel today is 100 rupees 
you tell yourself hey look no next one year i'm going to be busy and won't read it so let me read it a year later a year later it may not be priced at 100 rupees it may be priced at 105 rupees and you might tell yourself that during this one year period i'll put that money somewhere in a bank or in some investment and that investment is let us say earning you 8% and you think that therefore you'll become richer by 8 rupees but you don't become richer by 8 rupees you become richer only by 3 rupees because bhagat's book is going to cost you 105 so therefore the first important thing is that when when you decide to postpone the usage of money you want a what should i say reward for that in our example it's 8% why do you want a reward for that reason number 1 is inflation reason number 2 why you want a reward for that is that you can actually invest this money elsewhere i i told you about 8% let's say that that's a safe investment so what you're really looking at is a 3% extra return this is what we call the real rate of return on risk free investment so 5% is inflation 3% is real rate of return on risk free investment and then comes the most important thing forget about chetan bagas book for the time being let us say you have got 100 rupees you want to give that money i want to borrow that money from you or you want or maybe kishan rao wants to borrow from you you know kishan rao well so you might possibly charge him 10% you would know me less well so you might charge me 12% so what am i saying you want 5% for inflation you want 3% for as real rate of return on risk free investment and you want another 2% from kishan rao because he carries a certain amount of risk i carry higher amount of risk so you want 4% extra from me this 5 plus 3 plus 2 10% that you charge kishan rao is what people loosely call interest the 5% plus 3% plus 4% that you charge me the 12% people loosely call it interest in finance we call it the time value of money okay i know i am sounding technical but it's very important second important thing in this is let, let me give you an example i'll give you a very simple example to try to tell you that time value of money is actually motherhood try this experiment today or try this experiment tomorrow if there is a nephew or niece of yours who is 5 years old okay you take in your hand let's say six chocolates and give it to the kid and just as the kid is about to receive the chocolate withdraw your hand what do you think the kid would do the kid would scream and then you tell the kid let's say it's a nephew of yours you tell your nephew look i'll give you a week later the nephew himself to be pacified would not want six chocolates a week later he would want 10 if he is wanting 10 indirectly what he is trying to say is that he wants a reward for the postponement of consumption so time value of money or what some actually call the value of money in terms of time is the reward for the postponement of consumption i think i'll leave it at that i think alex raised his hand alex if you have a question please let me know Uh, or we could uh, take up the Q and A towards the end. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe the session itself will answer most of us or her queries. Uh, so, sir, you were telling about the time value of money and uh, how important is time uh, in relation to the uh, money or uh, its growth. Uh, we have or learned about uh, the simple interest. We have in our schools. We have learned about simple interest and compound interest. uh we would like to know the importance of power of compounding uh, in the context of saving and investing all right i'll give you an example it was albert einstein if i remember right who said compounding is the eighth wonder of the world um compounding as you all know suppose i charge 10% interest on 100 rupees it means every year under simple interest i charge only 10 rupees whereas under compound interest 
I charge 10 rupees of the 100. I don't collect the interest. So the amount becomes 110 at the end of the first year. I charge 10% on that. Therefore, the interest is 11%, 11 rupees. It then becomes 121. 10% 10 of 121 is 12.1, and so on and so forth. Uh, some even some actually, even as I'm speaking, if you can, if you can Google and ask what is the value of an investment of one lakh rupees made in Wipro when Wipro went for a public issue. Just Google that. And in the meantime, people can guess what will be that money. One lakh invested sometime in 1980, 82, 40 years ago. Okay, what in, is it? Uh, we grow in uh, 1990, is it? I think it was 82. Okay. Just okay. Google for Wipro, one lakh IPO value today. And you'll be surprised at the number that will get thrown out. And if you get the number, just show it on your screen. I'll just uh, read it out, sir. Okay. Uh, the, the value of investment of rupees 10,000 in Wipro in 1980. Just one second, out. just one second, just one second. Hold on, hold on. Sure. Shibi Ashwant has put a figure saying Wipro now is 700 rupees. Shibi, can you put on the chat box, what do you think is the amount that Saumya will now tell us? All right, Samia, go ahead, put out, uh, read out. Yeah, the 10,000 investment in Wipro in 1980s turned to rupees, a mind-blowing figure of rupees, 452 crores in 2017. That is 452 crores. There's no exaggeration. 10,000 rupees in 1981 or 82 is 440 or 50 crores in 2017. That figure is as of 2017, between 2017 and 2021, four years on, the stock markets have literally gone mad. If you find out the value today, it'll be a lot, lot more than 450 crores. Why I told, and if you do the arithmetic, I, 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 I'm not getting down to the arithmetic. If you do the arithmetic, the return is mind boggling. Um, if you can, Find out, Sameshri, if you can find out the rate of return, that will be great. Just see whether you can find out. Okay. 450 crores, 1 lakh rupees. You In the compound interest formula, you change the subject, bring R on one side, and see whether you can find out the rate of return. That's a phenomenal rate of return. Okay. Sure, sure. Now, since he asked us about the power of compounding, I'll tell you another thing. There is something called the rule of 69, or we can say rule of 72 for simplicity. The rule of 72 tells us that if you divide 72 by the number of years, it will tell you at what rate of return money will double. For example, if money doubles in four years, 72 divided by four is 18%. 18% is the rate of return at which money will double. And don't think doubling of money is small. In, across 20 years, 20 years today might look small. If money grows at 18%, okay, in four years it becomes, one lakh becomes two lakhs, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, 16 becomes 32 lakhs. In 20 years at 18%, one lakh becomes 32 lakhs. So the rule of 72 is a rule that all guys in financial planning use. What is the objective? Take the 72 on the numerator, divide it by the number of years, it will tell you at what rate of return money will double. Or somebody comes and tells you that I will offer you 10% rate of return. It means 72 divided by 10, 7.2 is the rate at which money will double. Compounding has a phenomenal effect. I'll tell you, I think this is a story that many of you would know. Um, there was a king, okay? There was a uh, subject, there was a person 
who did some good work for the king. And the king said, you ask me anything in return as a gift, I'll give you. And the subject, I'll, I'll say the individual, Mr. X, told the king, your highness, you know a chessboard, it has 64 squares. In the first box of the chessboard, I want one grain of rice. Second box, I want two grains of rice. Third box, I want four grains of rice. Fourth box, I want eight grains of rice. In each succeeding box, I want two times the one that I put that you put in the previous box. King smiled. That's all you want? He asked. And he said, yes, sir, that's all I want. When the doubling kept happening, halfway through at the 32nd or 34th square, all the grains in the granary were emptied. Nothing was left. Okay? You don't have to believe me. I, I'm not reeling out the numbers because these numbers will look phenomenal. All that I want you to do later today, Google. If you, if you have not heard about this, Google, write king, subject, 64 chess squares. And it will throw out the quantum of granary, the quantum of grains, total quantum of grains it will give you. That total quantum of grains, you each grain you assume is one paise. Okay? The total quantum of grains value at one paise, if each grain is one paise, that number is a few, few trillion Indian rupees. Far, far, far more than the GDP of India. I'll try to check out now and tell you a little while from now, tell you how much it is. But otherwise, take my word for it, the king's granary got emptied. Malay. Yeah, uh, that was what I wanted to tell. So based on what Saumeshri has asked me, point number one that I want I told you was that money has a time value. The time value of money is the compensation for postponement of money. Different people will want different compensations for postponement of money. That is why different people want different rates of interest. Point number two that I told you was that uh, compounding has a serious, huge power. I told you about the story of Wipro. The story of Wipro is also often told by me to try to tell people that if you stay long term in the equity market, you make a lot of money. But I wanted to tell that here now to tell you about the power of compounding. Google for the story of the king, the subject, the chessboard, and you will realize that no, compounding can be pretty, pretty large. Uh, yeah, that's did. beautifully explained, sir. Uh, now, in the light of what we know about the power of compounding, uh, as a medical student, uh, what are the good financial habits that we can inculcate right from the student life? That's a good question. I, I, I'm very happy that you asked that. I'll tell you, I won't say this is a story. I'll talk to you about an equation. I'll talk to you about a math equation. My father's generation worked on the basis of an equation called I minus S is equal to E. That means income minus saving is equal to expenditure. That means my father earned his money his first checks were for the savings. Whatever money he wanted to save, he saved. Let's say he earned 100 rupees. He put aside 20 rupees as saving and kept 80 rupees to spend. My generation, people of my generation, changed the equation. We began writing I minus E is equal to S. Math-wise, it is the same. But concept-wise, I minus E is equal to S meant I will earn income. I will expend what I like. If there is anything left, I will save. That's my generation. The next generation, the generation of my nephews and nieces, they work under an equation called I plus B. B for Bombay. I plus B is equal to E. That means I earn income, I borrow money, and I spend 
if you ask me, a good financial habit would be to save 20% of what you earn. Now you are interns, you get a stipend. I don't know what the stipend is. Whatever may be the stipend, if it is 18,000, if it's 20,000, if you're a house surgeon, whatever is the stipend, I would think that you must save minimum of 20% and that you should do on day one. If there is no stipend, that gives you money. If you ask me, I would say, put aside 20% of those money you're saving, spend the rest. And you don't know at some particular point in time, you can use that 20% money for whatever you wish. So the one financial, good financial habit that you must have is to write the first monthly check every month to yourself, which means that you'll put your money aside for saving. When I use the word saving, it's not just putting the money aside in a bank. It would mean investing in wherever you want to invest. You could invest in mutual funds. You could invest in equity stocks. You could invest in gold. You could invest in fixed deposit. You could invest in whatever. Samishti, I wanted to restrict yeah. just one habit so that no, it stays in people's mind. Uh, okay, okay, sure, sir. So moving on, uh, with the sort of saving being so important, uh, the next question is, could you please elaborate on where we could invest? What are the That's places a, and uh, what are the options that we have when we uh, start to invest? Uh, I will answer that. Uh, depending upon what stage in life you are, okay, you will make your investments. It's also a function of what kind of an individual you are. Different people have different appetites to risk. One of the fundamental equations of finance is that the higher the return that you want to earn, the higher is the risk you have to take. But the opposite is not true. Meaning, you cannot say, higher the risk I take, higher is the return I will definitely earn. It is right to say, higher the risk that I take, there is a greater probability of my earning higher return. Okay, so if you want to earn more, you have to take more risk. Not everybody can take more risk. The ability and the willingness to take risk has nothing to do with what you earn. You can be a multi-millionaire like Azim Premji, or you can be a multi-millionaire like Steve Jobs. Okay, that does not decide what it is because there, are, there is something called the DNA of an individual who is not happy taking risk. Not taking risk is not foolish. There are different kinds of investors. There are aggressive investors. There are conservative investors. There are moderate investors. Now I'll give you an example. I'll give you two examples. Warren Buffett, who is considered to be the world's most savvy investor, is a conservative investor. He's not an aggressive investor. And he's amongst the richest people in the world. Second example, what speed should I drive my car on the national highway? That's a function of many things. It's a function of A, the kind of car that I have. B, it's a function of what keeps me comfortable. So somebody who drives at 120 kilometers per hour is not necessarily smarter than somebody who drives at 90 kilometers per hour. 90 kilometers per hour on the national highway, somebody might say is conservative. And the aggressive guy might say, no, I want to drive at 140. Both of them are right in their own way. Both of them will reach their destination. Okay. So the important point to remember when you make investments is to first ask yourself what kind of an investor you are. There are enough and more information on the internet that will help you understand what kind of investor you are. Okay. That will decide where you would like to put your monies in. Okay. Now let me just read out, sorry, let me just dwell. What can be the kind of investments that you can invest in? There is equity stock. Equity stocks have given stellar returns. Between 1979, I know that's a very, very, very long period. And today, the return on equity stocks on an average is 18% per annum. What does it mean? If it's 18% per annum, it means money doubles every four years. How to do I know it doubles every four years? Rule of 72. 
72 divided by 18 is 4. Okay. Every four years, it's doubling. So 1 lakh became 2 lakh, 4 lakh, 8 lakh, 16 lakh, 32 lakh, 64 lakh, 128, 256, 512, 1028. 1 lakh in 40 years has become 1028 lakhs. That's close to a crore. And there are some investments like the one she talked about, Wipro, just 10,000 rupees became 440 crores. If it was 1 lakh, it would have been 4,400 crores. So equity is a great place to invest. But now don't tomorrow itself start investing in equity because equity also has its flip side. So you must understand that while equity gives great returns, it can also give bad returns. Um, between 2000, maybe 18 and 2020, for two long India, uh, years, our country was under the grip of a bear hug. Bear hug means prices were just falling. Okay. If most of us, including you and me, may not have the time or the expertise or the inclination to invest directly in equity, because investment in investing in equity is as complicated as doing a cardiac surgery. Okay. It's not such a straight case. It's as complicated as doing a cardiac surgery today with markets across the world being integrated. Okay. So you might decide that an expert will do it on your behalf. And that's where the mutual funds come in. In mutual funds, there are many ideas like systematic investment, which is the equivalent of your recurring deposit. That means you invest a fixed amount every month, month after month. Okay. So that's an option that you can explore. Equity is one, mutual fund is another. A third option, if you have made earn reasonably good amount of money and um, you can ask a portfolio manager to manage your money on your behalf. A portfolio manager is a manager who is licensed by the Securities and Exchange Board of India. SEBI is the market regulator, okay? That guy can manage your money and for that the minimum amount is 50 lakhs. Uh, how is it different from a mutual fund? To a portfolio manager, you can tell him that this is the kind of risk that I want to take. So equity is one, mutual fund is second, third is investing through a portfolio manager. These are the ones of the equity market. Then there is a debt market. You can invest in debentures, company debentures. You can invest in company fixed deposits. You can invest in bank fixed deposits if you're looking for safety. Today, there are lots of small banks. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not recommending any. I'm just trying to share a bank like the Equitas Bank, okay? For example, gives 7% on the fixed deposits. It gives 6.5% on your savings bank balance. And these are good returns. These are not bad returns. Meaning, compared to the low interest rate regime that we are now going through, where State Bank of India offers as ridiculously low a number as 3.5%, which does not even cover the inflation rate. These are good. So you have got bank fixed deposits where you can invest. You can also invest in gold. When I say you can invest in gold, I'm not talking about physical gold. Physical gold is a choice. Most Indians invest in physical gold. But if you're looking at gold from an investment perspective, there is no need to invest buy gold and stock it. You can in, instead invest in the sovereign gold bond scheme that the government of India keeps announcing from period to period, where at current market price, you will invest. Assuming, I do not know, suppose the current market price is 4,500. You go ahead and invest 45,000 rupees. So that's the equivalent of 10 grams. Seven or eight years is a lock-in period. At the end of the eight-year period, if gold's price hopefully has gone to 20,000, you'll get 20,000 into 10 money. You cannot exchange it for gold. But if the price has gone down, then you lose out. So it's just like investing in physical gold. Only difference is that you will not receive physical gold. You will participate only in the appreciation of it. Then there is, of course, real estate. Okay, You can invest in a house. There are people who invest in commercial property. Then there are several government schemes. I am particularly a great fan of the public provident fund scheme, 
The great advantage of a public provident fund scheme is that it gives decent return. Today, it gives about 8% return. More importantly, you can't touch your money until 15 years are over. If you're one of those guys in your 20s or the early 30s, and unlike me, you have not seen markets collapse, unlike me, you have not seen economies collapse, you would think, hey, what's the great point in investing in 8% uh, returns, 7.5% return, et cetera. People who have seen multiple cycles of markets going up and down, investments going up and down, real estate crashing and going up, they'll all tell you that you must put your monies in multiple, multiple baskets. So equity, mutual fund, portfolio management, real estate, bonds, fixed deposits, banks, gold. These are some of the investments where you can park your money. And my own suggestion is that you must not put all your money in one investment. You must spread your investment across four, five, six options. Uh, that's great, sir. Uh, now we know that we have a lot of options in investing, right from being the simple fixed deposit or uh, the equity markets or the real estate, as you were saying. Uh, but a lot of us may find these uh, technical terms too intimidating. Uh, we would uh, want to know what does it mean when a stock market goes up or down, or uh, what does it mean when the gold prices fluctuate? Uh, so if we are curious to learn more about investing, uh, how do we uh, develop these skills? How, what are the sources from All where right. we can learn the basics? All right. I'll tell you something I don't want any of you to take offense. Uh, I once went to a doctor very recently. I know him personally pretty well. So I was feeling very uncomfortable. So I went to the doctor and said, I have this, 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 and this symptom. And he's a fairly senior doctor. So I told him I have this, 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 and this symptom. Therefore, I have this, this, and this ailment. Please confirm. He said, hold on. I said, no, I'm not holding on. Please check this. He then asked me, who is the doctor and who is the chartered account? I said, it doesn't matter. Then he tested and he told me there is no problem at all. And then he said something to me. I do not know how far it is right. He said in the medical school, we call this the fourth year syndrome. When you are in the, he said that when we are in the fourth year in the medical college or maybe the third year during his time, I don't know. He said that is the time when we start seeing patients in a big way. And when we start seeing patients in a big way, we see them suffer some ailments we start thinking that we are also suffering something like that. And therefore, he, 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 the minimum point that he was trying to make was that what you're not good at, don't try to pass judgments over it. Today, with the onset of Google in a very big way, I'm sure you would have faced, there are a lot many patients who come to doctors and say, I read this in Google, it's like this, I read it here, it is like that, etc. And I'm not exaggerating, I've actually seen a doctor or a physician in his clinic put up, if you are coming to me for a second opinion after you have spoken to Dr. Google, please don't come. What I'm trying to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, is that it is good to have a smattering of a reasonable understanding of what investments are. Like Samishri said, it's good to know why mark, what is the meaning of markets going up? What is the meaning of markets coming down? It's good to know why gold prices are fluctuating. My own sense is that beyond that, you must allow, and I'm not pitching, you must allow a financial expert to handle your money. Okay. Having said that, now I will try to answer the questions that she raised. Market going up basically means that the investors are very confident about the future of the economy or the future of that particular company. There is a company, I don't want to name it. I bought that company in 2014 at 200 rupees. Today, that company, after a one for one bonus, is 4,600 rupees. Without giving you any technical, Suppose I bought 100 shares at 200 rupees, which means my investment was 200 into 120,000. Today, the 100 shares have become 200 because of what is called bonus. 200 into 4,600, whatever is the multiplication you do, that is its value. What I'm trying to say is that 
a few things you must let the expert handle but you must understand what is happening now what does this mean this means that investors are very very happy about this company they expect this companies to go up does it mean i will continue to hold it does not mean because i have bought it at 200 into 120000 today so uh, uh, today it is 200 into 4600 which is maybe 9 9 and a half lakhs or whatever which means that i might want to book profit so in the stock market when prices go up somebody is buying and somebody is selling so for every purchase that is taking place which is a vote of confidence there is a sale taking place which is a vote of lack of confidence okay but when there are more people wanting to buy like what happens in economics there are more buyers and less sellers prices begin to go up so when prices are going up it means that the public is thinking that this stock is good i'll give you a statement that an economist john maynard keynes a very very well known uh, american economist what keynes said i'm i'm telling you that because i don't want you to be taken in too much about with market price fluctuations not to read too much into it but only take advantage of it keynes said that stock markets are like a beauty contest where in a beauty contest there are 16 faces put okay you get what i'm saying there are 16 pictures put out and you are asked to judge who according to the majority of people is the most beautiful face what does it mean it does not mean who you think is the most beautiful person out there it means that you have to find out who according to the majority of people is the most beautiful in other words in the stock market what happens is that you may think that this is a great stock but if the rest of the world does not think it's a great stock its price will not go up you may because you are uh, in the medical field you may have fallen in love with cipla but rest of the world may not fall in love with cipla you may have uh, you may think that divi's lab is a great uh, pharma company because it's doing some outstanding research work the public might not think like that so its price might not go up but because you know and you believe that at some particular point in time public will also get to know you might start buying so you hold the stock for a longer period of time like the stock that i referred to earlier okay uh, I, and at some particular point in time when the public starts thinking oh divi lab is a great company then they start buying and you make your profit the moral of the story is that rising prices indicate public confidence falling prices indicate public is not confident when it comes to gold because samishri talk especially about gold the story about gold is a little different history has always recorded that gold is an absolutely defensive investment except what has happened in the last 10 years when gold really really went up through the roof it was people said catching up on uh, lost time okay more importantly what happens is that when people are very excited they go buy stocks they don't buy gold when pe- when when people are down in the dumps like what happens when an economy is falling people start buying gold so a huge purchase of gold is technically meaning at least academically is an indication that people are losing confidence in the economy gold is something like a last resort because people believe that gold has intrinsic value whereas it could in their point of view does not have intrinsic value so the fluctuation in gold prices normal course would be in that it would mean about people's feeling about the economy uh all right sir uh what uh, the next question that uh, we would like to know is is there a right time to start investing and saving yeah. or if i've reached a certain age is it already too late no, nothing, am i beyond help no, nothing is too late uh what is the youngest age here 24 22 no or 40 whatever may be the age nothing is too late because if you think it is too late two years later you will think oh i could have done two years ago ideal time to start investing according to me is when you start earning if you have started earning 
in your house surgency days, internship days, or earlier, that's the time to start investing. If you are if you are going to start investing after you have qualified as a doctor, finished your house surgency, that's the time when you should start investing. If you have not started investing for whatever reason, tomorrow is the time. Today is the time to start investing. Now that you have attended this program, today is the time to start investing. Because there is no point in ruining and telling, oh, time has gone because now you cannot ever get back that time. So to cut a long story short, the right time to invest is now. Uh, very well said, sir. Uh, all this while we have been discussing on uh, the habit of savings and investing. But on the other end of spectrum, there is, uh, there is uh, you know, the tempting credit cards and the habit of spending. So as a student or as a young practitioner, uh, should I have a credit card? And uh, if so, is it wise to have many cards? Ah, that's a good question. If you ask me, I'll tell you it's good to have a credit card. It's good to have a credit card because it carries enormous convenience. And my own view is that I, I, I said this, I think seven years back at the Kerala Management Association, uh, there was a national conference. I was asked to speak on uh, the future of cash. And I stuck my neck out and said, in the next 10 years, cash is going to disappear. Okay. I still believe that maybe in another five, six, seven years, cash will disappear. Already, there's a lot of disappearing happening. Today, for example, everybody is willing to take uh, payment online transfer, or to put it more crudely, Google Pay, the maid in the house is ready to get money transferred through Google Pay. The other day I was in a shop, uh, I, I, I bought something for 25 rupees, two five. Uh, sadly speaking, I did not have cash in my purse. I had a 500 rupee loan. The person said, uh, you can pay later. I said, no, you take the payment now. And then the person happened to see my purse and said, you have a credit card, I, we will take that card. I said, you will accept the card for 25 rupees. And the person said, we'll accept the card even for 10 rupees. So in other words, card is the equivalent of cash. A card is good to use. There are many people who think they should use a debit card. That's wiser. You can definitely use a credit card. Among the many advantages that credit card brings out is that it documents your expenses and gives you a statement. So if you're somebody who wants to know where you spend your money, that will be useful. But having said that, if you're going to be a spendthrift, see, there are many people who, when they carry cash in their purse and there's a product to be bought at 400 rupees, they will think twice. But when they have a card with them, they don't think twice. As somebody once said, uh, making payment through a card is having one peg too many and the hangover comes the following day. So if, if that is what is going to happen to you, then you should not be using a card. But if you are going to use a card for convenience, yes. My view is that you must use only one card. Okay, my view is you must use only one card. But sometimes what happens in a vendor, in a merchant shop is that your card does not work for whatever reason, God knows what reason. So maybe for that purpose, two cards. Having multiple cards and playing jigsaw with it, according to me, serves no purpose. If you forget to make payment, well, the charges are astronomical. The charges are super heavy. One just, just can't afford that. So my own view is that you must have one card or max two cards. Uh, sir, there's a, a repeated question coming up on all the chat sections on the YouTube and Zoom. Yeah. Uh, that is about Bitcoins. What is the mystery behind Bitcoins? We are uh, shown repeated ads on investing in Bitcoins and various, uh, various other uh, cryptocurrencies. What should we know about it? To be honest, I don't know about Bitcoins. Okay, So I, I don't think I should talk about Bitcoins because I honestly don't know what, what Bitcoins are. People ask me why someone in finance should not know about Bitcoins. There was a time when the government of India said Bitcoins are illegal. So I honestly don't know. I, I know too sketchy for me to tell you, uh, because if you have to know about Bitcoins, you must know how it is mined. You must know how it is generated, etc. I'll try to work out something. Maybe give me 15 days time. I'll try to put out a note of about 1500 words, share with you. You can share with me. Uh, uh, sure, sir. And uh, 
the other question is uh, about the insurance what kinds of insurance uh, are there for out for us and uh, in the context of medical practice uh, could you throw some light on uh, professional indemnity insurance okay we'll start from there professional indemnity insurance professional indemnity insurance is a must today lot many people are throwing up cases against professionals there never used to be an indemnity case on the audit profession today it's happening my own firm if i remember right has taken a professional indemnity insurance for 5 crores okay uh, and the premiums are not very heavy i i, I am fully certain that lots of uh, professional indemnity charges will also be made against the medical profession uh, once upon a time it was thought i don't know whether i can use that word once upon a time it was thought it was uncivilized to file a consumer case against a doctor uh, today everybody does that nobody doesn't do it because sometimes they're very very unhappy okay and uh, you know better than me that uh, in most of these things the guy who is sitting there to judge is not necessarily a medical doctor okay so it is good to have professional indemnity insurance there's no two opinion about it uh wherever there is a professional indemnity insurance try to buy the plan which has the cheapest cost uh you must take as much insurance as you think your purse can afford as premium for the year and of course it depends on the kind of practice that you do point number 2 is i don't have to tell you you know but nevertheless very often what happens is that people think that this will not happen to us i would very strongly recommend that all of us need to buy medical insurance in fact i i am a great otri i have been trying to move various fora of course it makes no great difference uh, to people to whom i make the move but i have always held the view that the medical profession guys should get insurance like that just like the government today under what is under the ayushman bharat scheme provides insurance for x amount of rupees i have always held the view that the medical profession especially after the kind of work that they have done in covid 19 needs to be given medical insurance by the company by by the government just like that that's not something that's going to happen in a hurry in our country you need to buy medical insurance there's no two opinion about that there can be nothing sadder there can be nothing sadder than going to a hospital being turned away from there coming out when you are carrying someone close known very close to you coming out because you can't afford the money okay um, i do not know how you take it but i feel and there are many people in fact i i recently interviewed a doctor of a hospital and i asked this question don't you think medical costs are too high i he said no medical costs are not too high i was surprised at the answer he said go take a look at what happens in the united states i told him no i don't live in the united states i live in india i earn my money in indian rupees okay anyway let's not get into that the point that i'm trying to make is that medical insurance needs to be taken and if you are young if you have not yet built up adequate investment you should also take life cover i'll give you a rough example of life cover okay suppose i'm just giving a number i don't know how much you earn suppose you earn 25 lakhs a year okay suppose you earn 25 lakhs a year 25 lakhs divided by 8% is uh, 25 into 12 is about 300 lakhs 3 crores 3 crores is the amount of insurance that you should take you may not be able to take it in one shot you can take it over a period of time why should a young guy take that kind of money because because tomorrow god forbid something happens then at least while the family faces the emotional stress of the individual having gone it does not face the financial stress 3 crores comes to the family 3 crores invested at some government uh, scheme at 8% will give you 25 lakhs so which means that your standard of living or standard of life can be maintained if 3 crores looks too high maybe 2 crores and the policy to take according to me and i am not pitching because i don't do insurance uh, the pol- uh, the pol- policy that i suggest people to take is term assurance plan term assurance plan is a plan where the premium that you pay at the end of the year that's lost it's not an investment it's like your car insurance if you buy a car insurance last day before uh, 
the insurance expires you are not going to worry about hey look my car did not face an accident let it face an accident today you are not going to do a cost benefit analysis it almost much the same way for medical cover sorry for life insurance you must take a term assurance plan a plan where only the life is covered anybody who comes and tells you no with insurance i'll mix up investment as and together because the objective of insurance is to protect or to provide life cover and anything that mixes it up is not on okay now let let me move to the next thing suppose you are earning 25 lakhs let's assume the same example and i said you will multiply 25 with 12 12 is because 8% 25 into 12 is 3 crores if you have already got 3 crores of wealth created then you don't have to take insurance or if you have taken the insurance you can get out of the insurance so it is not only important to know that we should get into insurance when we are very young it's also important to know that when our assets okay the assets that we have built cross the sum assured that we wanted then we must get out of insurance so to summarize the answer to what samesh has asked one indemnity insurance is a must uh, please don't look at it as hey should i spend that cost treat it as the cost of running your clinic or cost of running your hospital uh, medical insurance please buy treat it uh, imagine that it is mandatory just like vehicle insurance is mandatory please buy and the third one is life insurance take life insurance when you are young uh, work out what should be the sum assured rough estimate of sum assured is what you earn multiplied with 12 if you already have enough assets equivalent to that get out of life insurance yes sir and one more point that you have highlighted is not to mix up investments or equity with uh, life insurance uh, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of policies uh, mixing up both of these equity linked uh life insurance or various other types of insurance bad money money bad this that the reason i'll tell you why it's like this when people put their money they want something for themselves they don't understand that the insurance is not for them it is for somebody else it's something roughly like this i do not know or uh, maybe when you reach uh, the age where people write will people are hesitant to write wills they are hesitant to write wills because they think when they are writing the will they are signing their death warrant okay it's hard to imagine oh tomorrow if i go i will go off that's why i'm writing the will but the will writing is important in much the same way insurance is not for us insurance is for somebody else if you have nobody that's another important thing if you have nobody dependent on you there is no reason no need to buy any insurance so don't mix up with this money black plan unit like insurance plan just seek term assurance plan uh so the next question popping up is about sip uh, what is an sip and what are the benefits attached to it okay sip stands for systematic investment plan like recurring deposit in a bank in a recurring deposit what happens is that every month you put a deposit at the end of x months it matures so if you have taken a five year deposit recurring deposit your first deposit is locked up for 60 months second for 59 third for 58 so on 60th one is locked for one month that is a recurring deposit the sip is is a recurring deposit with a difference the sip as a word is used in the mutual fund industry where because it is tricky for people to decide which is the right time to buy most often what happens is that people buy when markets are rising and people try to crash out when markets are falling that's the wrong thing actually i won't say wrong thing that's counterintuitive you should actually buy when prices are low you should actually buy when everybody is selling in a panic people who bought shares one and a half years ago in february march 2020 when everybody and their uncle were selling they are the people who are today laughing their way to the bank but that's a difficult thing for people to do and that is why sip is suggested sip means come what may on a specified date every month sips can also be set for fortnights but let's keep it for month every month on a specified day a certain amount of money will get transferred to us keep what is the advantage you would be a disciplined investors 
most of the people who have made money in the stock market are people who have been disciplined they are not the guys who buy today sell tomorrow the ones who have made real good money are people who have bought and waited for 5 years 10 years some cases like me waited for 15 years and then seen their money grow okay so sip now pushes people to buy even when the markets are down that's the greatest advantage of sip this however does not mean that every sip is successful some sips can turn out to be bad there are some people who say sip is like putting what should i say good money after bad money so there are pros and cons but i would think that if you have selected a reasonably good scheme which you think will do well then putting your money in small installments every month instead of putting a lump sum in one shot because it's risky or because you don't have the money for it is a much better idea so that is what an sip is does it answer your question uh, definitely sir very clearly okay uh, the next question here is uh, uh, if i start making a small savings today uh what are the safe uh, investment options is it a fixed deposit or a recurring deposit in the current scenario today nothing is actually honestly speaking nothing is safe franklin templeton mutual fund was considered to be the mother of all safe havens franklin templeton defaulted on six schemes people lost their shirt the one good thing that we can say about franklin templeton was that they somehow managed to arrange and return most of the money they arranged to return most of the principal amount but what happened to the time value of money the fact that i might have invested 4 years ago what about the postponement of money what about the interest they don't did not happen dhfl you no know, people lost ilfs which was which was one of the biggest infrastructure company people have lost money dhfl money i understand is coming back to the investor um, or you know uh, if you were following the uh, the television uh, a lot of uh, cooperative banks you know, they did not pay return so even banks don't seem to be looking to be 100% safe so today there is nothing that is technically speaking safe but amongst what is available i think banks will continue to be safe and i think i must also tell you this under law the government guarantees 5 lakh rupees of deposit in a bank is guaranteed if the bank tomorrow fails and if you have if you have a investment of 5 lakhs in that particular bank even if the bank goes bankrupt the government will pay you the 5 lakhs therefore what many financial planners are telling people is that don't put a lot of money in one bank spread that money if you want to invest 75 lakhs in fixed deposit of bank put it in 15 banks that is what people are telling so from that perspective we can say deposit in a bank is safe but then it hardly gives you any return 4 5% today one of the reasons why a lot of money is going to the equity market and you see boom in the market is because fixed fixed investments are giving ridiculously low return so if i am going to get 4% putting in a low return i might as well take a risk and get nothing in the stock market okay so our uh, deposits in banks are safe are reasonably safe uh, then there are government of india bonds that give you 7% 8% they are safe government bonds are all super safe so that can be a safe option um and some of the mutual funds are reasonably safe uh, if you are going to invest in a mutual fund on your own then there is a website called value research value research gives ratings it gives three star rating four star rating five star rating based on return and risk it's written in easy to understand language without getting into too much of technicalities you can read that understand what it is and make investments so moving on a lot of us would be uh, looking uh, uh, about various options uh, of further education uh beat post graduate or uh, a super speciality course and naturally all of this nt is a lot of cost correct is there an equation to know uh, when it is wise to take an education loan uh, what would be the re uh, returns and risk associated with it are you asking whether it is good to take an education loan 
yes and uh, what are the scenarios where it would not be wise all right that's a function of what you are going to put that money to use uh, for example just borrowing is all right borrowing is is good if that money is going to be put into something that is going to earn you if you borrow money to spend on a wedding according to me that's bad if you borrow money to buy a house it's good i would rate education as an investment that's greater than a home okay so it is for you to decide whether that post graduation super speciality is worth it or not i i would be the wrong guy to say that but if you think yes this super speciality is worth it that this super speciality is going to have a market tomorrow then it is good to take an education but you will also have to make judgments about uh, what will be your repayment capacity etc cetera, etc cetera. you should also i'm not an expert in the medical field but of what i have been doing uh, very recently a couple of us uh, did a fairly detailed article on uh, detailed report on some 7500 word report on information technology in the healthcare environment and the more we read the more we spoke to doctors we began to realize understand and appreciate that automation and artificial intelligence the first specter where it is hitting out is in the healthcare industry uh the more that i read the more i am beginning to think that there are some things that machines are going to do far better than the human being far better than the doctor don't misunderstand my saying that uh um, there are reports i can't vouch for it but there are reports that come from uh, the harvard medical school some of the top uh, uh, medical schools of the world which says that some of the reports radiology reports uh, many of the test reports are being uh, done much better by machines rather than by individuals there is also a report that i that i read about cancer detection being done much better over a period of time by ai etc so it might be a little important to understand which part of your medical profession is likely to disappear okay i do not know because i don't know the medical profession well for example in my profession in the profession of accountancy audited accountancy i have held for the last 15 years i have told people that the that the business of preparing tax returns are going to go away the business of preparing tax returns have now literally gone away there is enough and more automation in india uh you can go on to the website and there are reasonable software that are available where you can do it on your own the argument that today is circulating in the ca fraternity is that there are a couple of technology entities which have filed approximately 60 lakh returns of people and if you take 2000 rupees as uh, the fee for preparing a tax return it's actually much more but on average if you say 2000 is the fee the ca profession the small and medium enterprises of the ca profession have actually lost 12000 crore rupees of value so there can be some areas in your profession which can disappear you have to make sure that you are not getting into studying those areas otherwise i think if you don't have the money you should in you should look at education as an investment very well sir the next uh, uh, question by the viewer is what is an equity and a debt and i believe it is something to do with the equity and debt instruments as well so there is a difference between equity and debt uh, let's take the example of you starting a hospital when you start a hospital you put in money you want your friends to put in money you want the bank to put in money if you put in money it is equity if your friends also put in money and they want to become owners at least financial owners then that is also equity equity is not returnable as a owner you can't take back your money of course there are some ways by which you can get your money back that is if your company gets listed on the stock exchange for example apollo hospitals to take just one example your equity can come back but it is not the job of apollo hospitals to give you back your money you can find another guy who is stupid enough to buy buy a particular stock you can sell it to him whereas debt is not like that in the case of a debt you as the company in your hospital you have, if a bank has given you money 
or if I give you, let us say, 100 lakh rupees as debt, you are obligated to return by 100 lakhs. You are also obligated to give me interest. Whereas in equity, I become a part owner. If I give you 100 lakhs and get equity shares, I become a part owner in the company. There is no guarantee that you will give me any return. The return to equity shareholders is called dividend. There is no requirement of any dividend being given and you don't have to return my money at all. If at all I want my money back, I should find some third party who will give me my money and I will hand over the stock to him. So equity shareholders participate in profits. Debt holders don't participate in profits. Debt holders are the risk covers guys. They are the guys with deep pockets, lots of money, but they want a fixed rate of return. Uh, we have a very uh, technical question posted here. Uh, they're asking about uh, what is intraday and what is options and futures for Medicus? Okay. Intraday is where you buy a share today. And I, 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 I won't suggest that you do that. Intraday is where you buy a share today and you will sell it off today. The understanding is that you will sell it off today. So if, if a share is quoting at 710, you bought intraday, that means during the day, and uh, that's called day trading. At the, at the end of the day, whatever is the price, it gets sold. So if you bought at 710, end of the day, it is 690, you lose 20 rupees. And if you have bought 1,000 shares, 20 to 1,000, 20,000 is gone. Overnight, you lose 20,000. The good thing is that if the 600, 710 becomes 750 in a day, you make 40,000 rupees. Intraday actually is based on daily fluctuation. Many people believe that there's no great science or logic to it. It is highly speculative because you're not buying it for medium to long term. So that's the meaning of intraday where you buy today, sell today. Options and futures are a very complex, more, very different game. I do not know whether I, I would really be able to explain that to you at in that very short span of time. I can only possibly tell you uh, option is something that gives you a right, not a duty. Okay. It gives you the right. It gives you the right, but not the duty. I'll give you an example. Suppose you want to buy Gray's Anatomy. Okay. You want to buy the book Gray's Anatomy. You go to a shop and the guy says the price is 3000 rupees. And then you tell yourself, ah, hey, next one month, I'm not going to read this Gray's Anatomy. So let it be there. And then you tell the shopkeeper that I might come one month later and buy this book. So give me the right to buy. If I buy, if I come one month later, you have to give me Gray's Anatomy. I might also choose not to come. Okay. And then between you and he, he, you decide. You don't have to give any deposit for that 3000, etc. He might say that because I am taking the risk. He might say that I'm taking the risk. What is the risk that you might not turn up? he might want 25 rupees. Okay. So that 25 rupees is called premium and you and he will agree on the price. Let's say 3000 is the price. So on the due date at the end of the month, if Gray's anatomy book in the market has gone up to let us say 3200, then you will come here, exercise your option, buy the book at 3000, keep it with you, or you will immediately sell in the market at 3200 and make 200 rupees profit. Okay. If Gray's Anatomy book from 3000 falls down to 2900, you will not turn up. Why would you want to buy a book at 3000? If you wanted the, wanted the book, you would still go to the market and buy it at 2900. You will not go to this shop. This is roughly speaking up what options are, but it's a far, uh, the essential idea is this, but there are lots of complications to it in terms of knowing how to play it. Uh, I'm not too sure whether this is the right forum to talk about that. So we are pretty much coming to the end of uh, the queries. Someone else asked about uh, what are indexed funds? Oh, index funds, okay, all right. An index fund is a mutual fund which invests in the index. Index is the stock market index. Uh, it, For example, how do you know that there is inflation? You look at the wholesale price. What is the wholesale price? The wholesale price is an index of some 500 odd items. Okay, when the 500 odd items price on an average goes up by 2%, inflation is 2%. If it goes up by 10%, it is 10%. Like that in the equity market, there is the Bombay Stock Exchange Index. 
think of that as the wholesale price index. There are 8,000 shares in the BSC. Some 3,000 are actively traded, but the index consists only of 30 stocks. Okay. These 30, so when somebody says that the index has gone up from 60,000 to 62,000, gone up by 5%, it, it really is speaking means that these 30, stock, these 30 stocks have gone up by 5%. Okay. You might ask, how is that fair? There is this old story that people used to tell in my first year of college that when you do a sample, when you go to buy rice in a shop, you want to see the quality of rice. You're not going to pick every grain and see. You're going to dip your hand, pick a few grains of rice and see how it is. If it is good, you say, okay, this entire bag is good. In much the same way, the 30 stocks are supposed to be a barometer of the stock market. If these 30 stocks are going up by 5%, we'll say the market is going up by 5%. Our bad luck, the other stocks might actually fall. So our index fund is a fund which invests only in these 30 stocks. So as the index goes up, their investment also goes up. As the index falls, their investment also falls. So the, why people invest in the index fund is because if you tomorrow look at the papers, you will find that the Nifty, which is an index, has gone up by 5%. Or the Sensex, which is an index, has gone up by 3%. You want to participate in that. You can't go and buy those 30 stocks. You can't go and buy those 50 shares of Nifty. In, instead, you will invest in an index fund, which will do this job of buying those 30 and those 50. So I think we're pretty much done with all the questions and you've graciously answered uh, all of our questions with so much of uh, patience. I personally have read uh, many of your books, uh, including the popular textbooks. And I know the kind of uh, uh, treasury of knowledge that you have. And today I'm really happy that uh, we could all share with, uh, with all the viewers of the White Army. And uh, many thanks for graciously accepting our request and uh, sharing your valuable expertise and advice. Uh, just a last minute query coming up, just a minute, sir. Um, good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah. Um, sir, my doubt was about um, like saving on taxes, sir. Like, as in when we are investing, are there modes on which we can save from the, I mean, save the taxes which we would incur in whatever forms of investment we uh, do? Yeah, there, there, is, there is a, there are various ways in which savings, uh, tax savings can be done. One is what is uh, called Section 80C, where uh, up to one lakh fifty. Uh, one lakh fifty thousand or so, you, your tax can uh, get reduced. Okay, if you um, if you make your investments in in those schemes, you can possibly Google and find out what they are. They are some of them are equity linked saving schemes. Then there is a public provident fund. Then there is an uh, NSC etc. Then the uh, the, uh, the insurance premium, medical insurance premium that you pay, that also goes to reduce your tax. Okay. Uh, aside of that, there is also uh, there is something called the national pension scheme. Someone who invests in the national pension scheme, that amount also goes towards reducing tax. This is on the income front. On the regular annual earnings front, these are some of the sources through which you can save your tax. Otherwise, there, are, there aren't uh, very many options uh, there. You can also look at investing in investments that don't tax. For example, public provident funds interest is not taxed. So the seven and a half percent, let's for simplicity say it is 8%. The 8% is, is not taxed, which means after tax you get 8%. That is almost equal to a pre-tax number of, what should I say, 12%. Uh, because if you earn 12% uh, and 33% goes by way of tax, then you really get only 8% after tax. Whereas public provident fund, let us assume, is 8% after tax, 8% uh, rate. I'm talking about simplicity, it can be 7.5 or whatever. So, therefore, somebody who invests in a public provident fund, which gives 8% tax free, is on the same footing as somebody who invests in a 12% fixed deposit, where he gets taxed 33%. So, when you invest, you should also look at not just the rate of return, you should look at the after tax rate of return. 
So thank you, sir. And there are other things. If you make capital gains, for example, you sell a house property, you make gain on that. There are you know, lots of uh, laws by which uh, you can reduce the incidence of those taxes. One more question is regarding interest on home loans. Uh, the uh, interest that we pay, there is an element of tax that we save on it. Yes. Uh, how good is it? as a instrument of tax saving if uh, there is actually no necessity of borrowing funds for a loan we hear a lot of advice ah, ah, as you know just uh, get a loan no i understood uh, that that's a smart question yeah. i'll answer that i'll try my best to answer that that's a good question it's like this let us for argument sake assume that a home loan is costing you 7% okay let us for argument sake assume that the savings because of tax simplicity let's say it is 1.5% so you have effectively borrowed at 5.5% it, it is unlikely to be 1.5% because the amount that the government allows for interest is very small but assume it is 1% then what you are actually paying is uh, what did I say was the interest rate let's say you borrowed at 7% and 1% is because of this tax benefit that you're talking. So your cost is really 6%. That means you're going to borrow money at 6%. You said you have got lots of money with you. If the lots of money that you have with you, obviously you're going to put it somewhere. If that somewhere gives you more than 6% rate of return, then you borrow money. If that somewhere is going to give you less than 6%, suppose it gives you only 3%. Why should you borrow at 7% when you have money which is being invested only at 3%? So you should not borrow money. So to cut a long story short, find out the effective cost of your borrowing after taking into account the benefit that you'll get from interest. If your alternative investment rate, that means the alternative rate at which you can make the investment is greater than the cost of borrowing, okay, don't borrow. Sorry, is greater than the cost of borrowing, borrow. If it is less than the cost of borrowing, don't borrow. I don't know whether I've made things complicated. So I'll just give you a number. If the effective after tax cost of borrowing is 7%, if your alternative monies can earn more than 7%, then borrow money. If they will earn you less than 7%, don't borrow money. Uh, that's really great, sir. That's the difference between an expert's advi advice and a layman's advice. That's what we keep hearing. It's always good to take a home loan, uh, but uh, there are there's more to it than that. Uh, so I think we've uh, pretty much answered all the queries. Okay. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you for joining, uh, and uh, thank you for this wonderful session this evening, and. Uh, uh, it was very enlightening and it made us think it, it is, I think uh, or many of us are going to go back and, you know, research more on it, read more on what you've told. Uh, thank you so much for that. And thank you uh, so much for uh, taking the time out and uh, uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you so much, sir. And I hope uh, we have more of these sessions in the future. Sure. My pleasure.